Now, we've been going through this series called The Power of One. And today you're going to share with us the power of the gospel. I wonder if these folks know who you are. <laughs> this is a father figure to me, a man who loves Jesus, Pastor Gallimore. He's going to share with us God's word. And I don't know about the rest of those folks, but I'm excited about what God's going to say through you. So, Pastor, would you take the mic and share with us God's word? And just before I begin... I would like to recognize a dear friend of many years who is visiting with us, Mr. Winston Bennett and his clan. Where are you, Winston? <laughs> Warm welcome. Glad to have you with us. Yes. Let me greet you in the name which is above every name, the name of his saving majesty, King Jesus, the first and the last. I believe he's the reason why we are here today. It is in his name that we meet, and his voice we want to hear, and his touch on our lives that we want to feel. And so we invite him to come among us in the person of the Holy Spirit and to make his presence felt so that when we leave here today we will know it was good for us to have been in the house of the Lord. Sonia and I would just like to say thanks to Metropolitan Baptist for the love and the support from Pastor Connor and from all of you, for your care and for your prayers. And just want you to know that any Sunday you come here and don't see us, it is because I'm ministering God's word in some other place. Thank you, Metropolitan, for being such a very special family indeed. As you know and has already been said, we have been pursuing a series, The Power of One. The Power of One. And this morning, I'd like for us to reflect on the power of one verse of Scripture. And before we turn to that verse, let me just acknowledge up front that I believe that my message to you this morning may appear to some of you as being redundant and unnecessary. But in as much as the theme and the substance is fundamental to our faith, I believe it is important for our consideration and our reconsideration. So then, I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles as... <coughs> The bulletin says, and let us turn to Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. But before I read, let us pray. Father, we are about to read from your word. And whenever we open your word, we are aware that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And your ways are past finding out. So we ask right now for help, the help of the Holy Spirit to help us to hear what you would say to us, open our minds that we may understand, and open our spirits that we would receive and respond. I ask you to hide your unworthy servant behind the cross and grant that Jesus Christ will be lifted up among us today for it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Romans 1, 
Romans 1.16, reading from the New King James Version. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Would you read it with me, please? For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. My brothers and sisters, if I were to give a title to my message this morning, it would be the theme, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I trust that the gospel of Jesus Christ never becomes old hat to any one of us. That no matter how many times we hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, I trust that we will never become so familiar with it that it loses its ability to excite our spirits and to gladden our hearts and to fill our souls with joy and worship. For the truth is, there is nothing in this world to be compared to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is important then for us to remind ourselves about the meaning of the word gospel. And there is, there is one of the great Bible scholars, reformers, in fact, a man who became a martyr for the faith in the early 16th century, William Tyndale, who wrote this. He said the word gospel signified good, merry, glad and joyful tidings that maketh a man's heart glad and maketh him sing, dance, and leap for joy. And I say amen. I believe he was under anointed revelation. The word gospel means good news. Good news. The joyous proclamation of God's saving activity in Jesus Christ on behalf of lost and sinful mankind. Matthew's gospel, Mark's gospel, Luke's gospel, and John's gospel are really the stories, the fourfold account of the good news of what Jesus Christ achieved in salvation on behalf of lost humanity like ourselves. My brothers and sisters, the first thing I would like to say this morning is that the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. That is what it is. Wonderful, exciting, life-changing, soul-saving, good news. Good news. Now, I realize that the devil is hard at work in our society to convince men and women that the gospel is really bad news. That the gospel is opposed to your enjoying yourself. That the gospel is opposed to everything pleasurable. But the gospel is in fact nothing more than a set of archaic rules and regulations to bind up folks so that you don't enjoy life. It is something you don't really need and you can do without. But we are here this morning to defeat and to deny the devil's lies. We are here to say the gospel is good news. It is good news indeed. 
Second uh, Corinthians 4 and verse 4 hits it right on the nail when it says, The God of this world has blinded the minds of many, blinded them into thinking that the gospel is bad news. What we want to say this morning, here and now, loud and clear, far and wide, that the gospel is good news. The gospel is good news. I believe that this is the great good news that all of mankind has been longing for and yearning for and hoping for throughout all of history. In fact, if we go back to the early records of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, we find here the first mention of of the Evangelion, the good news, the good news about a son, the seed of the woman. And this good news is reiterated by God in his covenant to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And as we read the entire Old Testament, we find again and again too many references in typology, too many references for us to cite this morning of how the Old Testament writers and prophets just prophetically looked down the age for the coming of someone who would bring us this kind of good news. Think for a moment about the many, many references in the book of Psalms. Think for a moment about the many references in the books of the prophets. I think of Isaiah, called the evangelist of the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 7. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel. And then Isaiah chapter 9 says, Unto us a child is born, and a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And if you have read Isaiah 53, a whole chapter descriptive of the suffering of Jesus Christ. And so my brothers and sisters, this anticipation, this desire, the longing of the ages is for somebody to come for us with good news. And so I'm hoping this morning that you are feeling with me that the gospel is indeed good news and good news for us all. The gospel in my view is good news because of man's bad and desperate situation. My brothers and sisters, we are all by nature evil, sinful, violent, immoral, and the list goes on. It really doesn't matter which TV station or which radio station we listen to. It's only more and more of the same, more and more evidence about the fact that mankind is flawed and failing and sinful. This is who we are. And the Bible says that all of us are included in this category. There is none good. No, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Psalm 51 and verse 5 says, We go astray as soon as we be born. But thank God, the gospel is good news because the gospel has the ability this morning it is an antidote it is an antidote for the thing that plagues us it is an answer to the problem of sin god has given us good news good news against our desperate and sinful situation the gospel is good news not only because of our sad and desperate situation, 
But the truth is, in our situation, we face a grave peril. A grave peril. My brothers and sisters, you remember that God said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. You remember that God issued a decree out there in the Garden of Eden, placed our four parents in the most perfect environment, gave them full authority to have dominion. He said to them, you can eat of everything, all those luscious fruits and plants there, except this one. The day you eat of this one, you shall surely die. And you know the story. You know the story. They defied the law of God and ate of that fruit and therefore incurred the penalty of death. And because we are Adam's seed and Adam's children, that penalty has passed down unto us. Every single one of us in church today, every single one born since then, we inherit the Adamic flaw. All of us have the sin gene running through our system. All of us have this proneness towards uh, disobeying God. But thank God this morning, in the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, we have some good news. For God has found a way to overcome man's condition. It has uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to cleanse us from the Adamic flaw. It has the power to avert man's peril. And it has the power to make us free even from the guilt of sin so that before God it is as if we have never sinned. The gospel of Jesus Christ is good news indeed. It is good news and it is good news that comes to us through Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ we don't have any gospel. Without Jesus Christ, we don't have any good news. And I know that making a statement like that sounds like bigotry. It doesn't fit in with the political appropriateness of our present age. I realize that. But I have to say to you this morning, I am not the one who made it up. I simply read it from the book if you have a problem take it up with the author of the book he's big enough uh, to deal with it but the bible makes it clear in acts chapter 4 and verse 12 neither is there salvation in any other and you could stop right there and that would be conclusive enough neither is there salvation in any other there is no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus and Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life no one comes unto God except through him so it is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that we have this kind of good news but we are grateful this morning that the Jesus Christ of whom we speak is not some kind of religious fairy. He's a real historical person. He's a real individual. And you and I this morning, if we could get in a time machine, we could go back into the days when he lived and walked on this earth. But as this story of the good news of the gospel unfolds, we are faced with a divine dilemma. My brothers and sisters, the Bible teaches us that God is holy, that God is just, that God is righteous, and that God is immutable. That means he does not change. 
This is how God is. So whatever God decrees, whatever God says will come to pass. He is that kind of God. And you will remember now that God decreed that the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And therefore God's holiness and God's justice demands that this judgment, this punishment be carried out. Because if it doesn't happen, we may begin to impugn the very character of God. But the Bible also tells us that God is love. 1 John 4 and verse 8. God is love. He made us because of love. We are made because God is love. And despite the fact that we are failing, we are sinful, we are disobedient, and we are ungodly and God-rejecting, the story is that God loves us still so here now is the divine dilemma god who is holy and just decreed that the punishment of sin is death and we are guilty we are guilty of breaking the law of god and we are under judgment and condemnation but god is also a God of love. And so here comes the divine dilemma. His holiness demands justice, but his loving heart wants to find a way of reprieve for all of us here. Holiness demanding justice and love calling for mercy. And we know the good news is that the wisdom and heart of God found a way for him to remain just, righteous, and holy, and at the same time to remain redemptively loving for those of us who had broken his law. And so we give God thanks this morning that the gospel, the gospel is good news, for God has found a way. God has found a way to meet his own just and righteous demands. And this morning then, all of us here can rejoice. We can rejoice because God has found a way. And this is good news for us all. Hear what John 3.16 says. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so as God decreed, someone, someone has to take the punishment of death. Someone has to take the punishment of death. But the problem is, anyone who would satisfy the heart of God must himself be without sin otherwise he's merely bearing his own punishment because of his own guilt and so we need somebody somebody who is without sin to be able to take the punishment for us my brothers and sisters you know the story in all of earth and all of heaven there is only one candidate and his name is jesus He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the co-creator with God the Father. He's the only one. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. For he had to come down here. He had to become a man. He had to be living among us to be our kinsman, redeemer. He had to go through so much of what we go through. But he had to be sinless. So he was born of a virgin. The Holy Spirit came upon Mary, overshadowed her. 
and said this holy thing his name must be called Jesus for he will save his people from their sins and so this child that is born does not inherit the Adamic flaw he's born without the Adamic sin being upon him and you know the story she gave birth and Jesus was raised some 33 years he lived in Nazareth going around identifying with us hungry sometimes tired and sleepy sometimes he passed through the various phases that we go through as human beings he taught us the way of God and then one Friday morning he climbed Golgotha's hill and there our forebears your parents and mine they took spikes and they nailed his hands and his feet to a cross and they lifted it off the ground and dropped it in a hole and he suffered and bled and died for crucifixion is one of the most painful ways for a human being to die and it was shameful and ignominious as he hung there upon the cross and he cried out to the father why have you forsaken me he was forsaken that we might be chosen he the sinless one took our place and our punishment he the guiltless took all the blame so that this morning we can gather in his house and say good news for every sinner who is here for everyone who's done something wrong for all of us who have failed God somebody took your place and mine somebody took the punishment that we deserved somebody exhausted the punishment of God and by his death and by his resurrection he offers to us what he achieved salvation good news this morning for every guilty child every guilty son or daughter of Adam somebody has taken your place somebody has taken my place somebody has suffered for the wrongdoings we did so that we can go free this morning the gospel of Jesus Christ the joyous proclamation of God's saving activity in Jesus Christ on behalf of lost and sinful people good news for men and women bogged down in their sin good news for those whom the devil would deceive good news you are worth something this morning for God has sent his son to take our place and the punishment that we deserved so you can well understand why the Apostle Paul this morning is shouting off the pages of Scripture I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ we may have to suffer some things we may have to be spoken against we may even have to be like some of our brothers out there in the Middle East have our heads taken off because we refuse to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ I trust that you are in that company today that you won't let anyone make you be ashamed of him you won't let any circumstance even the possibility of a promotion on the job would make us deny Jesus Christ the Apostle Paul says I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ and he is re-echoing what Jesus said in John 3 16 because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes John 3 16 says whoever 
whosoever believes on him will have everlasting life and Paul is saying no I cannot be ashamed I will never be ashamed for proclaiming the good news of God's saving work in Jesus Christ because that is the reason why I am here today because he saved me he saved me yes it is salvation to those who believe my brothers and sisters you remember the Philippian jailer if you know that story from Acts chapter 16 now that night when he was awakened out of his sleep and the prisoners are all set free by the power of God and he knows he can't tell the judge anything in the morning as to how these people are set free. He's about to kill himself. And Paul said, don't do it. Don't do it. I have good news for you. What must I do to be saved? The man said. And the apostle Paul said, it's been done for you. Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can be saved. I have a feeling... I'm not speaking to anybody here who is just a moment away from killing yourself. But if by any chance the, the circumstances of life and situation pushed you to that point of desperation and God's grace brought you here, then we would say in the name of Jesus, don't do it. Don't do it. God has already made a way. He's opened up a way. He can change your life. You don't need to be scared of the judge tomorrow. If you believe on Jesus Christ today, good news, even for people who are at the point of desperation, ready to take their own lives. Thank God for that good news. And I'm only here today to say, by the grace of God, God. He's called me to be a messenger, a minister, a proclaimer of the good news that everybody needs to hear. That God has already acted on your behalf. He's taken care of everything. The day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Physical death. Yes, physical death. Yeah, well... Some of us now, you know, he said three score years and ten. And if by verter of strength, four score. And I've passed the four score now. Some of us a little nearer than others. But don't let that deceive you, you know. Death knocks at the door of young people. As well as older people. Oh yes. But thank God this morning when you can know. That if you do what that jailer did, there is something for all of us here today. No matter how desperate, how sinful, how ugly, how bad our past and present might be. Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. He took your place. He took my place on the cross so that we can be forgiven. So that we can receive salvation so that he can open up heaven unto us but you and me we must believe something my brothers and sisters I have a feeling there's not a single one of us here hearing the gospel for the first time would be a little hard if you come to Metropolitan would be a little hard I would say if you live in America Unless you don't have television or radio or you make sure that the devil keeps you from tuning in to anywhere that the gospel is proclaimed. But this morning, it cannot just be out there of what God did. If you are concerned about salvation, if you are concerned about having the penalty of death removed, then we must believe something. I want to call on us today
to affirm our belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the one who died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the dead and he sits right now at the Father's right hand making intercession for us. He calls us by name and he wants to say to the Father, yes, I see that hand, John. I died for him too and, and for Mary and Tom and whatever else your name might be. Jesus, we must believe he's God's son, that he died and took our sins. We are the sinful and the guilty ones, but somebody took our place so that we might go free. There's a little everyday kind of story. I've used it hundreds, maybe thousands of times. If any of you have been around uh, when I'm in youth evangelism and so, or maybe I've said it, who knows how many times when you reach my age, you don't remember everything anymore. But you know, it's an everyday story. It falls short. Let's say I am driving through Hollywood and the speed limit here is 30 miles an hour. I'm not sure quite what it is, but let's say it's 30 miles an hour. And I'm speeding at 90 miles an hour. I've broken the law. And the police prosecutes me for breaking the law. And I go to court. And Pastor Connor knows that I'm in trouble. And he comes to court with me. And the judge says, are you guilty of breaking the law? If I'm honest, I'm going to have to say I'm guilty, Your Honor. I was driving 90 miles an hour through a 30 mile an hour zone. I'm guilty. And the judge says, $100 fine or 30 days in prison. I'm a poor man. I don't have any money. But Pastor Connor, that's a different story. <laughs> yes, uh, your brother said that's a good one. Pastor Connor knows that I am in trouble. I have no money, but Pastor Connor, who is a man of means, takes a hundred dollars out of his pocket, pays it to the clerk of the courts, and I go free. I broke the law, but he paid the penalty for me. I don't know of any simpler way to explain to us. Uh, we broke the law of God, but Jesus paid the penalty for me. And so if the policeman comes afterward and says, but you are the man who was driving at 90 miles an hour in Hollywood and you need to come to jail, I can say to him, no, sir, I'm free. That man paid the penalty for me. What is testimony? Anything less than saying, Jesus paid the penalty for me. I am guilty. I deserve all that God had said. But Jesus died and took my place. And today, I am not worried about the judge anymore. I am not worried about that sentence of death anymore. I am not worried about spending eternity in a devil's hell anymore. Somebody has taken all of that for me. And I am rejoicing today. Hallelujah for the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For unworthy sinners such as we are. And I close by saying, are you here today? There's no other way to be saved. Please don't let the devil deceive us. There are too many people I've met who think that if I live a good life, I remember a man, I won't call his name for a relative of his is right here, who used to say, I'm a good man. I only keep one wife and he's from Jamaica and I don't thief anybody's money. Uh, for those of you not from Jamaica, I don't steal anybody's money. And he thought that surely 
that was good enough. Some of us think that God's just going to weigh the scales, the good against the bad, and if the good outweighs the bad, he will let you into his heaven. Please understand, there's no other way to be saved. Not by good deeds, not by charitable deeds, not even by being religious, not by coming to Metropolitan, not even by being baptized in our baptistry here, no Christian rite or ceremony will do it. You and I must simply come to the foot of the cross and acknowledge, Jesus, my sins made you die on that cross. And you died and took the punishment that I deserve. And today, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And God grants you forgiveness, cleansing, salvation. He writes your name down in his book of life. He brings you into his family for as many as received him, they become children of God. And someday when we stand before him, if the judge is your savior, it's okay. For should he forget? And Father, forgive me for even making a statement. But should he forget? I will remind him on the 23rd of September, 1953, Bethany Baptist Church, Dudley Camock was the preacher, that I heard the good news that said, if I believe on Jesus Christ, he will save me. And I bowed my knee that day, surrendered my heart and life, received his forgiveness and his cleansing. He saved me that day. He won't forget. But if he should, I'll just remind him, check the records for September 23, 1953. You will see Jerry Gallimore's name right there but today maybe is the day he could write your name may I in his name say he offers the same forgiveness the same pardon good news for every child of Adam what Adam lost Jesus regained and the Adamic flaw the Adamic stain and the Adamic judgment reversed by what Jesus, the Son of God, did at Calvary. The gospel is good news for all, available only through Jesus Christ, his Son. Amen. Thank God for the gospel. Thank God for the gospel. <laughs> if you're thankful to him for the gospel this morning, please stand as we sing this song, our closing hymn. before we sing another verse please allow me to ask is there anyone here today anyone here today for whom this gospel is good news for your salvation is God speaking to anyone today then may I lovingly in the name of Jesus invite you to trust him for your salvation He's done everything, everything to forgive your sins, to cleanse us, to save us, to make us ready for 
eternal life. Is there anyone here? Just, just raise your hand where you are. And I would be delighted to pray for you, as I'm sure others here. God bless you, sir. Anyone else? Don't put it off a day longer. Anyone else? Anyone else? The next verse says, Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. We're going to sing that. And if God would give you the grace and the strength, sir, to move from where you're standing, it would be my delight to shake hands with you. Invite pastor to just join me here as we would be delighted to pray with you. And any others, don't wait. I do not know what tomorrow or even what the rest of the day will bring. But right now, yeah. right now. We're still in God's day of grace. Yes. Right now, salvation, full and free, is available for all of us. Let us sing. And if God speaks to your heart, <clears throat> come forward. We'll be de delighted to pray with you and rejoice with you. <clears throat> 